Now that we've spent some time talking about the shared characteristics of all life, let's spend some time talking about what makes living organisms different from each other. So even though all living organisms share these same seven characteristics, there's great diversity in life. As biologists, we try to organize the diversity of life in meaningful ways. In fact, there's a whole field of biology known as systematics, or taxonomy, that studies the ways in which life is organized. Now, the kingdom system used to be the highest level of organization within the Linnaean hierarchy. There are things like the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom and the uh, bacterial kingdom. But as we've done further research, we found that there are some genetic clues and genetic indicators that there should actually be a group over and above kingdoms, and we call those domains. Now, there are a total of three domains of life, and these domains differ from each other based on some of their fundamental genetic signatures or fundamental genetic characteristics. So let's talk a bit about those three domains of life and the prokaryotic domains. So the three domains of life are domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. These three domains of life include all living organisms that are alive today and have ever existed. All life is composed of cells, and there are two general categories of cells. Those two general categories of cells are that of the prokaryotic cells, which are the smaller, simpler cells, and then the eukaryotic cells. Which are larger and more complex. Now both bacteria and archaea fall into this group of prokaryotic organisms. Whereas organisms in domain eukarya are all made of the more complex eukaryotic cells. Looking at these domains of life, again we have domain bacteria and domain archaea, and all the remainder of life is in domain eukarya. So let's spend just a little bit of time talking about the prokaryotic domains. Bacteria are abundant in all areas of the earth, even on the surface of and within the human body. In fact, it's said that there are more non-human cells in and around the area of your body than there are human cells. Now, these non-human cells are much smaller and, and much lighter than the human cells, so by mass you're still mostly human. But if you just went by cell number, the area of your body is actually more non-human than human. Now, archaea, they're also found in abundant areas, but they are most likely to be found in extreme environments. And by extreme in this case, I mean environments that aren't normally conducive to light, such as high heat or high salinity. It's for this reason that archaea are often referred to as extremophiles. When we look at the general diagram of prokaryotic cells, they do not have internal compartments, but that doesn't mean that they are unorganized. We still see that they have cellular structures, they have boundaries, they have regions which contain their genetic material, it's just that that genetic material isn't bound in some sort of compartment. Instead, it's just floating within the cytoplasm or, or liquid internal filling of the cell. Let's talk a bit about 
protists, which are the simplest of the eukaryotic organisms. All life other than prokaryotes falls into the domain eukarya. This includes all plants, all animals, all fungi, and all protists. Now, all of these organisms share the same general cell type, that of the larger and more complicated cells, called eukaryotic cells. So, as I mentioned, all plants, all animals, all fungi, all protists, they fall into this group. Now, what is it that makes eukaryotic cells different? Eukaryotic cells have these internal chambers or compartments, which are known as organelles. Now, it's believed that all eukaryotes originated from a single progenitor eukaryotic cell. In this case, the term progenitor simply means the first or the origin of, or, or where all the other eukaryotic cells came from. Now, it's believed that this eukaryotic cell originated when a larger prokaryotic cell engulfed a smaller one. That in and of itself isn't all that weird. In fact, this is a common way for larger cells to, to behave, consuming smaller cells. But what happened in this case is, instead of that smaller cell being digested or broken down for food or nutrients, that smaller cell became a permanent component in that larger cell. That smaller cell received maybe resources and protection, whereas the larger cell was receiving some sort of benefit by having that smaller cell present. Eukaryotic cells have many chambers or compartments, and we call these organelles. It is believed that many of these organelles originated through this process, which we call endosymbiosis. Now, talking about the organisms that are made out of eukaryotic cells, the simplest of those are the organisms in kingdom Protista. These are the simplest of the eukaryotes, or organisms composed of eukaryotic cells. Like all eukaryotic cells, protists contain these organelles. Now, it turns out that there is great diversity in this group. And this kingdom, Kingdom Protista, is in the process of being broken down into multiple smaller kingdoms. Now, why would that be? Well, let's look briefly at this tree of life and see the relationship between these types of organisms. We see we're under domain Eukarya, under Kingdom Protista, but there are several branches leaving this tree of life. It's the presence of these branches that means likely we'll be transitioning this into several smaller kingdoms. Now, when we zoom in just at those protists, these are the types of organisms we're talking about. Diplomonads and dinoflagellates, ciliates, water molds, and surprisingly, even algae. Algae includes uh, seaweed along with organisms that you'd find in streams and ponds, and even occasionally in your water pitcher or aquarium. So protists, most of the single-celled eukaryotes, are in this group. This includes both amoeba and paramecia. There are also multicellular protists. Such as algae and giant kelp. Now, unlike bacteria, protists are capable of sexual reproduction. Some protists are pathogenic, meaning they are disease-causing. In fact, in our earlier video talking about those massive fish die-offs, protists were the culprit. Protists were the organism that were causing those fish to die off. Occasionally, you will also hear reports in the news of individuals who are swimming in pond water or swimming in lakes or streams. Water gets splashed into their faces or up their nose, 
an amoeba may actually enter their body's system. Normally, amoeba are not dangerous, but if they end up traveling to the brain, it can cause amoeboid meningitis, which could potentially be a fatal disease or infection. That's all for this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about plants and fungi. See you then.